Hello, and welcome to Still Standing. I'm Shannon. I'm your host, and this is the podcast where we talk about people overcoming challenges and sharing their stories of hope and inspiration so that we hope that you too will be inspired and know that recovery is possible, healing is possible. And today I have with me Ethley Ann Vare. Ethley Ann Vare is an author, journalist, and screenwriter who's been working in television and publishing for more than 30 years. She has a resume that is so long, um, but her, her, uh, website link will be below if you want to know more about her. Today, I have her on because she is also the author of a book called Love Addict, Sex, Romance, and Other Dangerous Drugs. I love the title of this. Thank you for showing that. Uh, today, we're here to talk about recovery from sex and love addiction. So, Ethley, thank you so much for being willing to join me today, for lending your time and your insight. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say today. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, it's a subject that I've been interested in and talking about for a long time, um, because for a long time, I just thought I was nuts. I mean, a lot of people thought they were nuts. Um, and it's it was just a relief to discover that I just have what the technical definition is, a chronic and relapsing brain disease characterized by compulsive reliance on mind-altering substances or behaviors despite negative life consequences. It's just like, oh, there's a description. It's a brain disease. There is something wrong with the neurotransmitters in my brain. I need extra stimulation. I need more dopamine. I need more serotonin. I need more oxytocin. It's just, it's physical. It's just like, you know, it, having diabetes is not immoral right? Being allergic to peanuts is not a, a bad, it, you know, insufficient willpower. It's not, I'm not just a, um, a lovesick teenager that can't control herself. I'm not just immature. I've, I've got a brain disease. And that's just like, that's such a big, that's such a big exhale, right? And I really continue to study and try to learn more about this and more about recovery from it because it's gotten worse. I mean, we have we have thrown gasoline on the fire of sex and love addiction ever since, you know, like dating apps. It was actually, you know, back, e you know, e even eHarmony and Plenty of Fish and Match when they were on computer screens were a problem. But now with hot and cold running porn and, date, you know, and hookups, it's like, I mean, my line is, it's just like, if booze all of a sudden was free and the drinking age was nine, I think we have more alcoholics, you know, because that's exactly what's happened. So sex and love addiction is just like, it's a big problem. And I, uh, I'm so glad that I'm not alone, but I feel so bad for everybody else that's suffering because it sucks. Being a love mm -hmm. sucks. It's not cute. Yeah, all high school romance and cute and and you know um, endless love and the notebook and, and it's not it's not cute. I love that you said that because I too my whole life just thought I was high, just very sensitive. Just, I wanted to take no. my life every time a relationship ended, and I just I thought I'm a hopeless romantic. Yeah, I'm, I'm a just a romantic. romantic. No one told me till I was in my thirties this was a thing and. That's why I want to talk about it, because I think it's so stigmatized, but it's also not taken seriously. And yet, how many people do we know that, to some degree or another, suffer from the same thing? Do you know how many friends I that have gone into program and said, that's what this was? It's so normal. Uh, and I want you to, I'll, I'll ask you about this, but I just have, I feel like, especially with the name of the recovery program, right? Sex and love addicts, anonymous. People go, so you're sex addict. Okay. So that, well, you could just stop that. That's just, they don't, I, I heard someone in a meeting once he was a heroin addict. He said, I have withdrawn from heroin and I have withdrawn from people. And the withdrawal from people has been 10 times harder to kick and it is more painful. And I think people think, I've heard people say, like when Tiger Woods had his affair, I heard people say, oh, he's just looking for an excuse. You know, that's just an excuse. Let's talk about what sex and love addiction encompasses, because it's not as simple 
as people think. And it's from experience, one of the most painful emotional conditions that someone can suffer from. Or people kill themselves all the time. People I kill, almost did. Kill, yeah, people, people commit suicide, but people also, you know, drink drink themselves into, you know, drunk driving accidents and to, you know, falling asleep with a lit cigarette in their hand and burning burning to death. There's, I have, God, I, I, people send me examples of stuff all the time. And like, there was the woman that tried to crawl into the guy that she had a crush on's house because he wasn't answering her calls and she got stuck in the chimney and he was on vacation and they found her bones weeks later. I mean, and, th and this woman was a doctor, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it does not matter how smart you are, yeah. right? Because I, I'm, I'm a smart yeah. kid. I was a smart kid. But I still was curled up on the floor in fetal position, just waiting for the phone to ring from some, you know, like just insanity, just a totally made up in my head romance. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about, well, I would like to hear where did, let's talk about you, your background, whatever you're comfortable sharing about your childhood, your evolution. You know, what, what was your journey like? What did your addiction look like? And how did it, how do you, how did it start? Um, well, I started, I think um, <laughs> my, my first drug of choice was St. Joseph's orange flavored aspirin for children. Um, I mean, just anything that, that made me feel less in pain was good, right? Anything that altered the way I felt was good. Um, I don't, I am not going to be breaking my own anonymity in any uh, recovery mm -hmm. program because this is a public forum and I just don't do that. But I'm a massive fan and supporter of all 12-step recovery programs and I recommend that anyone go to them. And I know that SLAA is definitely more has more shame and stigma attached to it. I think as going to SLA these days for people is like going to AA in 1942. You know, it's just like knock three times and say, Joe sent you and don't tell anybody where I was. And oh my God, I hope I don't run into anybody I know and all that kind of thing. Um, but um, my impression is that people sometimes being a sex addict sounds more powerful than being a love addict and so it's just like oh i'd rather be a sex addict but then being a sex addict seems so predatory so then oh i want to be a love addict because then i'm the victim you know i sometimes i want to be the person holding onto your ankle as you're trying to leave the room and sometimes i want to be the person leaving the room shaking you off my ankle and i think that those of us who have sex and love addiction will bounce back and forth from one to the other i think that women will generally men are more willing to identify as sex addicts women are more willing to identify as love addicts i think that's just cultural and social um and um my experience has been that uh, women will use sex as a coin to buy love or at least words of love and men will use words of love as a coin to buy sex, but that the people that, that we flip, you know, that one day you're grabbing the ankle and the other day you're being kicked off the ankle, you know, you're, yeah. the, yeah, you're okay. I, I found I, what I discovered through my own journey is I went in with a very severely anxious attachment. What I didn't realize until later was that I'm also a severe avoidant attacher as well. Just give me the the right trigger you know if it's the unavailable person that's all i want is that person's love but if they're all in and chasing me and pursuing me shaking of the ankle leave me alone yeah no that's always my line is my my fear of abandonment is matched only by my terror of intimacy oh my god yes <laughs> isn't that insane yeah, yeah. so how does that and and my the most yeah. attractive thing about a man is his back as he's leaving the room, but at the same time, if he stays too long, I get so bored so fast. Yep. And that's like, you know, and that's dopamine, desperate yep. for novelty. You know, when something stops being novel and loses interest. Um, oxytocin is the bonding. Um, mm -hmm. when you start craving that, then you can't let go of it. And that's why we stay in abusive relationships. Um, and, um, it's just, it's just a, just a mix It's it's just a cerebral mix combined with very poorly developed prefrontal cortex. I took one of those attachment style tests. Apparently I have disordered attachment, mm -hmm. which is exactly that. Sometimes I'm one, sometimes I'm the other. 
Yeah, that makes total sense. And obviously, everybody's story is different. Why we are like this, you know, whether it's, uh, well, there are two things. I, I, I really do want to talk about that chemical thing, because another thing that I've really learned is I was getting high off my own dopamine and my own serotonin, my own oxytocin. So, and I am a highly sensitive person. Now, me, I didn't have abusive parents or addict parents. I had a birthmark on my face. Kids told me I was ugly. I believed that narrative for the rest of my life. Do you know where it started either for you or just in general, like what kind of themes do you think led to your own addiction? Well, obviously I confused love with longing because I had an unavailable dad, which is really common. But the people who were studying this stuff, they say that there's three things. You got the the ACE, the adverse childhood experiences. First, you start out with the brain wiring, right? Mm -hmm. We have reward centers that aren't firing on all cylinders. Then we have an adverse childhood experience. And then it's the environment. Then it's what we surround ourselves with. And it's our culture and it's our socialization. And we live in a culture that generally says, you're nothing without a man. You need a man. You need to be in a relationship. We judge you by the, the partner that you find or how many partners you find. So so it, I, I call it the forest fire. You need the kindling, which is the brain wiring. You need the match, which is the, you know, the childhood trauma or sometimes being exposed to your drug of choice that just like, oh, that cocaine was exactly what I needed. That lit me up right. And then you've got the oxygen to keep the fire going, which is the, you know, the lower companions or the, you know, the, the social group that you live within. And I, and to me, the, the great thing about 12-step groups is the first thing that's practiced is abstinence. We, we cut off the oxygen. It's like, it's going to take a while to disperse that kindling and work on your brain wiring. You're never going to be able to undo the adverse childhood experience, although you can come to peace with it. Um, but uh, the first thing you do is you smother, smother the fire and then start dealing. And as far as my home, you know, I also, I come from a perfectly nice, well-educated, upper-middle-class, artistic, New York, New York Jewish, you know, um, I went to uh, uh, Bronx High School of Science, right? Um, we, um, we had, uh, but my dad was also, um, you know, World War II veteran who had massive untreated trauma. Um, he suffered from depression. My mother was, um, you know, a pill head and a compulsive gambler. Um, they, you know, it wasn't, it, it, it was not, it was not a child centered household. You know, they had, they had their own stuff. And so I always required more attention than I was getting. And I call love addiction affection deficit disorder. It's like, I don't have it anymore. Um, and so I spent much of my life trying to get the attention that I didn't feel that I had enough of as a child. And um, how you do that when you're a girl is you do it with sexuality because that's the, that's the quickest payoff. Um, I did it with teachers. I did it by being smart. I was teacher's pet throughout my young life. And that got me a, a lot of the um, attention and, and approval that I required. Um, but I'm an approval junkie. There's never going to be enough. Um, and, you know, once I discovered sexuality, it was like, well, this works. <laughs> the this ultimate works. manipulation. And, and, yeah. and then cocaine worked even better. So there you go. Yeah. And I love that you talked about it's not just sex, it's validation. And again, I'm not speaking for everyone. This is just a common theme. I know I experienced this. Everyone sort of has their own dysfunction around intimacy who may go into a recovery program for different reasons. But when, you know, when you do your, your 12 steps, uh, the, the first step, admitting you're powerless, uh, the second, what, what oh yeah, inventory, personal inventory. So it said, they ask you, when did this begin? Right. So I'm like, well, this began. And I remember writing like this began when I cheated on my husband. And then I was like, oh, wait a second. No, it actually goes back to, oh no, before that it was, okay. No, it was college. Then I was like, no, it was high school. Oh no, it was, it was middle school. Oh my gosh. It was, it was elementary school because I was thinking of it too literally. Just substitute the sex for validation, people pleasing, letting people walk all over me, being a doormat. 
just wanting approval, want, being the good like girl. It. Yeah. Like it. it goes back so far. Oh, I had fantasy relationships with boys in second grade. And I knew nothing about what a relationship was like. I mean, I'd never kissed a boy. Yeah. I just, like, and yet I had, I call them affairs. I had affairs that what meant, what it meant was I had a crush on someone. I didn't, I had no idea what sex was. We're talking about grade school here, but these crushes to me were just very important. Yeah. It's giving that weight like that, that weight of the validation of external validation, because we don't feel okay and safe in ourselves. We need someone else to tell us you're good. You're, you're worthy. You get my approval. So that's really, yeah. And you know, I don't, I don't think that's unusual, honey. I think that that's, that's like the human condition. I think the difference is that for somewhere between six and 10% of us, once we find the thing that gives us the validation we uh, we're off to the races. It starts the addictive mechanism in our head going. I think that most everybody wants, desires validation. And some people, they're sort of like, um, they, they, you know, it's just like, well, I don't understand why he can't just drink like a gentleman. You know, most people can validate like a gentleman. Right? Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, I did a really good job at work today. I'm really proud of myself. They don't then go and, you know, work 22 hours a day, stabbing their coworkers in the back to try and get more, you know, approval from the boss. I mean, I think some of us just have a, just, we, we have a, a, a physical response. We have a different physical response to stuff that other people don't. Yeah. And interestingly, I don't know, this just occurred to me, you've accomplished so much in your life. You're so creative and you don't just do stuff, you make stuff happen. And that's, you know, we're LA people. That's kind of why we go there. <laughs> but uh, but I would love to know too, it just occurred to me, do you think some of that, was that literally just your own drive and passion? Or do you think that sort of came from this need to achieve? Does that have anything to do with it for you or no? Oh, I think a lot of it was to uh, get the attention and approval. Absolutely. I mean, people, nobody goes into I always went into very public facing things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was supposed to be a scientist, right? I went to Bronx High School of Science. My, I started college pre-med. I was supposed to be a research biologist. But then as soon as I discovered the college radio station and people started knowing who I was and they started giving me, you know, like feedback and approval and, and applause and everything, just like, oh, oh I'm, I'm in, I'm all in. And then I just, I switched, I switched majors. My, my joke is always, you know, I've switched majors to sex, drugs, and rock and roll one Tuesday afternoon. Um, but it really, a lot of it really is about, uh, I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be yeah. noticed. I wanted, I wanted to, I'm sorry, the neighbors are doing brush clearance. If that, if you're here, I don't play. even hear it. Yeah, it's okay. good. You're good. Um, but, um, it's, uh, no, definitely it, it was part and parcel of that. It's like, see me, you know, I, I, I think that there was a part of me that despite the, <laughs> the red hair, always felt a little invisible, right? Just like see me. And so my, yeah, a lot of my drive to succeed in, in my field has been because I wanted, um, yeah, I wanted to, uh, I wanted uh, awards and prizes and, you know, attention and acclaim and, and, um, but I always tried to do, I always said that my goal was to um, inform and entertain, uh, but underneath that was always and to and to be acknowledged for it I so relate with that I mean I didn't speak as a child because I had such bad anxiety I didn't want people to see me so I stopped talking for three years because people told me I was ugly so I went well I'm not going to talk and no one will look at me and I, I became invisible but I isolated I had no friends I didn't speak to anybody I kept myself small so now I'm a voice actor and now I'm an actor and a podcast host and a writer and, you know, not, and it, obviously it's because I, I love to connect. I love to share. I want to help other people. And so do you, but there is something underneath that. I think of just like, like you said, wanting to be seen is what drew us to that in the first place. You were a DJ, you were a, uh, you worked for um, entertainment television as a host and that sort of thing. And it's, it's not all self-indulgent, but I think it comes from this need like the reason we're drawn to it is because it makes us feel good. And there's that, that I would love to know, how did your addiction for you, what was your sort of, 
drug of choice or how did the acting out look to you? And when did it start to become painful where you realized something isn't, this isn't working for me anymore? I, um, it never seemed like it was a problem until I got clean and sober because I just thought again, that I was a romantic. I, I was just a sensitive soul. I just picked the wrong guys Right. I mean, I picked you know, the, the drug dealer who beat me and, you know, got. <laughs> but he loved, but he loved me, but he told me he loved me. Right. So I can't. It's um, and, you know, just there was I could never be without a man. And I would pick. And just like incredibly unavailable. I never there's like a bad boys. It's just like, mm -hmm. bad, I don't know why bad boys are so romantic and appealing, but they're just, again, I think that part of that is um, acculturation. We're taught that they are, but part of it is um, that I, I have such a low opinion of myself. Your low opinion of me validates my existing belief. So it's just like, oh, you get me, <laughs> you know, I'm crap. Right. And also you're glamorous and romantic. So if I have you, then obviously I'm not crap because I got the cool. Guy. So I would always be pursuing the guy that I perceived as being out of my league, even though probably in most situations, mm -hmm. most ways they weren't right, mm -hmm. uh, by anybody else's objective standard. They were just unavailable and not able to give you what you needed. Which or were worthy them, of which made them cool you know i don't i don't i'm i'm sure that you can relate to being one of those people that will walk into a room with 30 people that think you're fabulous yep. and the one person that turns their back on you is the person that you have to go and engage with 100 percent, 100 percent. and you know even after all the healing and i'm really done a lot of healing and i know you have too i just said the other day why am i only attracted to the why is that the person that i am attracted to is the you know my last relationship same story unavailable bad boy and it's like i love myself but we choose the bad boy at least we used to and i think this is something i've been thinking about how even after we heal or while not that we're ever not healing it becomes like neural pathways that i've healed so much so now i went into this going i love myself though like i know that i'm worthy that's not the issue. The issue is there's this old wiring that still draws me to the same type. I've changed, but my type hasn't changed. And so I think also it reinforces the negative core belief. So when we're still in that addiction or low self-esteem, we are, it is somebody's rejection of us reinforces our negative core belief that we are not lovable. And so then we have to we think we can change this. If I can get him to love me, then it will mean that I'm lovable and worthy. Now, even after all the healing, and I'm like, I know I'm worthy, not just know it, but feel it. I feel powerful. I love myself. I am full of self-esteem. That person is not healed. And therefore, they still can't receive my love and in fact, reject my love. And now I have the understanding that it isn't me. They're rejecting intimacy because there's an attachment wound there as well. But I do think that once, to some degree, we can do so much healing, but we still may gravitate towards the unhealthy. Now, if he were a drug, I could just stop using a drug. But when you have an addiction to food or intimacy, people- right. You have to find balance. It's you gotta find balance. So when was it that you were like, Ethley? This ain't working anymore. What was your sort of rock bottom with it? Um, yeah, there comes a point where you just look at a guy and say, baby, you are a six foot two inch pile of cocaine. And <laughs> as attractive as that might be, I'm not going to. Uh, and you know what? And sometimes I still do. Uh, mm -hmm. Because sometimes I just like getting high and, they, and you don't have to change your sober date over a guy. <laughs> yeah, totally. That's such a good point. Um, but... Um, the um what you call well uh, it's interesting that you brought up the neural pathway i call it the neural cow path it's just been yeah. so long it's just and, and that goes back to what i was talking about about 
prefrontal cortex, you know, your amygdala back at your brain is just like the call and response is just like, that feels good, I do it again. That feels good, do it again. That feels good, do it again. And then we just never develop the, mm, but am I going to have a hanger over in the morning? But does he have a wife? But is that going to cost me money I don't have? But am I going to lose too much sleep? But is this going to hurt my feelings? But is he going to be an asshole? We never go through that. And over time, I have definitely learned to, you know, like take a trip around my my prefrontal cortex before I make those decisions. And sometimes I'm just a brat and I go like, yep, no, nope, yep. he's definitely he's definitely not a keeper, but what but what the hell? <laughs> you know? Um, I am I have been married and divorced in recovery because, and that's the thing you say that you're always going to be drawn to the wrong guy. No, sometimes it's just he's he's just not that into me. And sometimes yeah. I'm just not that into him. You know, not everybody has to be with everybody. Not everyone's right for us. So just because I pick someone and it doesn't work out doesn't mean that it came from my brokenness, right. my self-loathing. Not most relationships don't work out. Yeah. They don't. And so that's why we keep experimenting. Some people are really lucky. Some people, my son is great at relationships. My son is still, my son's a grown man. And he is still friends with the kids he went to junior high school with and the, his roommate in college. And he's been married for 11 years. And I can't imagine him not staying, you know, until one of them dies. Um, and I can, my marriage to his father lasted like seven years, seven year rich. Both of us were just like, uh, this is not as sexy as it is. This is not as fun. <laughs> we're going to find greener pastures because we're both addicts right yeah and so i cannot i cannot tell you that i have solved the bad picker problem um i can tell you that i have not been you know in fetal position on the floor feeling you know like my eyeballs seeing red and humming in my ears and my stomach wrenching i haven't haven't done that in 20 years um, because I just, I, I don't, I don't know. I just, um, I just don't do the stuff that I know that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I don't call men who are not calling me back. Yeah. Um, I just don't do it. I just, I, I literally, I just don't call men period. I mean, the only reason that I would reach out first to a guy is if, you know, I need to tell him something about an, an appointment or something, you know, I mean, it's just like, yeah. I don't, I don't chase. I just don't chase. Yeah. I just because that was like really bad behavior, and I just had to take contrary action. And so that just helped a lot. Um, you know, my my line is always he he knows where I am. He knows where. To yes. Find, you know. I'm in. I was just said to a friend. I'm in my less forcing, more allowing era, mm -hmm. and I think chasing was one of my things back in. I mean, back in the day, and it was. It, it's in. You know, obviously, I. It's all part of the journey, and I don't. I mean, I, w I don't want to say I don't regret it, but I also, if I hadn't made all those mistakes, I wouldn't be where I am today, which is self-loving and healthy and happy. But I love this so much. I love your honesty, first of all, because part of healing, I think, is rig as we talk about rigorous honesty with yourself and another person, whether it's your sponsor, you know, but I, that's what I love because I've, when I started this podcast, I wanted people to know this isn't, I don't want stories of perfection. I want us to acknowledge that healing, grieving, recovering from addiction, it's not a straight line. You will sometimes veer off the path. Sometimes you will step back. Sometimes you will move forward. And that's okay. That it doesn't, as long as we're moving forward, I am not healed. I am healed in every other way I feel. And like you said, I do not act out anymore. There's none of that crazy making stuff. I personally now do not have a desire to have kind of a casual encounter with someone. It's I want true connection and commitment or I'm not even interested. And, I, and I'm not doing it to pass the time, you know. So but in, in the past, it would be anyone who would pay me attention. Mm -hmm. So there have been healing. And yet. Yes, I'm still attracted to that six foot three, unavailable musician, uh, emotionally unavailable, cool guy. But so I'd love to talk about that because when we go into whatever recovery you are, some people don't choose 12 step. I personally swear by it for me, but however you do it, I would like to know 
what are some of the main keys that have helped you in your recovery? Like what, same thing, I would be on the floor, couldn't go to work, thought I couldn't live. How did you get to this place where you can accept and not be afraid to feel your feelings and not try to run from the feelings? Um, oh, I'm not the best person in the world for not running. <laughs> I spend a lot of time listening to podcasts. Yeah. I like having conversations with people who aren't in the room. They're just not romantic attachments. Yeah. Right? I do not I do not feel the need to listen to my head or to go just like dwell on stuff. You know, I get up in the morning and I and I do a little writing, but not a lot, just a couple of paragraphs. Just usually I don't want to get up. <laughs> just yeah. like really I don't want to get up. Um and um you know, and I'm involved in a community that's very service oriented, that's very connection oriented, that that really helps a lot. Um, I, um, you know, and I, and I take contrary action. When it first started, when I first started in uh, recovery from sex and love addiction, um, I had the simplest bottom lines because, you know, as you talked about with food, without, without drugs and alcohol, abstinence is pretty easy. You just, you don't drink, you don't use no matter what, you're sober right um with food it's trickier because it's just like okay what are my trigger foods what do i not eat white powders right do i not eat white white foods you know do i not eat processed foods do i not eat sugar do i only eat three meals a day and not snack between meals it's you you know you find something that works as an abstinence for you um for sex and love addiction i had to write down bottom lines my abstinence will be, I'm not going to do the, these things, which all be, always get me into trouble. So my abstinence was um, not going to date married men or men who are in a relationship, not going to date men more than 20 years younger than me, and I'm not going to have sex on the first date. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that just gave me plenty of leeway to have plenty of fun relationships. And it was just, I didn't, I didn't date, I had nothing. <laughs> Once I cut out the married men, the men half my age and the sex on the first date, I wasn't doing, I was <laughs> none. <laughs> I was celibate. And it was just like, oh, all of my dating behavior was in these problematic areas. Well, that's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So then, then I had to start taking contrary action to that. And that just makes it, um, <laughs> my Al-Anon sponsor just texted me, um, <laughs> Sorry, but, um, the um, it is um, so it it's it's a question of when I stop doing the things that hurt me, I'm not in so much pain, and yeah. then I can heal. Then I can slowly heal. It's just like I don't, and, and sometimes it's just really being um, just being present and aware. It's just like you 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 and whoever you were listening here probably you know knows that hamster head phenomenon of oh I should have said that and then he would have said that and then I would have said that and then he would have said that and then I would have said that and then he would have said that or oh when I see him I'm going to say this and then he's going to say that and then I'm going to say this and then he's going to say this I'm going to say this and he's going to say you know and I just had to whenever I found myself getting to I should have said no just no, suit it. And then I can put it in a podcast, right? I mean, yeah. sometimes I need something else to drown out in my head. Um, and it would be nice if I was so chill that all I needed to do was just, mm, just, <laughs> and it was, but my head's too busy for that. So I find that meditation definitely does help and prayer does help and music does help. But also sometimes just listening to something interesting about medieval history helps. You know, just sort of get my mind away from that, that the, the cow path, the neural tract that you were talking about, you know, mm. just get it, just nudge it to somewhere else that can be really helpful. Um, and then I just, you know, uh, I start to have to do things that bring other ways to bring, you know, dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin into my life. Get a dog, man. Yeah. Get, I've got, there's nothing like the oxytocin you get from a dog and rescue it, be of service, right? Save a dog's life. Um, dopamine, there's lots of ways to find newness and exciting, learn something new, do a sport, to try something dangerous, maybe a little bit, a little bit dangerous, bring some nice, you know, sort of uh, adrenaline in there with the dopamine. Why not? You know, um, go, go do a little skydiving or scuba mm -hmm. diving. 
Um, and um, serotonin is easy. You know, I mean, yoga is great. Um, get massages, take bubble baths with, you know, nice eucalyptus oil in them. I mean, there's lots of things that I can do that are good for myself. Uh, one of the best, of course, is being of service. You can see tons of, you know, fMRIs and PET scans showing that the brain responds to being of service and to meditating very much the same way it responds to heroin. It's just it's calming. it it just it's make it makes you feel good. Service makes you feel good. So do that. I mean, the, there's actions I can take and enough time taking these actions, positive actions and contrary actions, then I just somehow I'm just not as messed up. And you that's... summarize that so well, because I I always say the same thing about what is it about 12 step, for example, that works. And for me, being of service gets us out of our own head and into giving, inst because I think so much of addiction is what can I get? What can I get? So I remember... I also date much younger men, and there was a time where I dated a much, much younger man. <laughs> um, nothing inappropriate, just, you know, um, but I remember how, you know, and my sponsor said, but why are you doing this? I'm like, he doesn't care. Like, he doesn't, she said, you're not thinking of his needs. I'm like, he doesn't care. He, he, he's 22 or something. Like, he's stoked. She's That's like, she yeah. said, yeah, but like, how are you being of service to him? By being in a relationship, you're not interested in dating him. And I'm like, he's not interested in dating me either. He's, she's like, that doesn't matter. It's about keeping your side of the street clean. It doesn't matter if he cares or not. It's just the dynamic. Like, are you actually loving him and actually being of service? And that really changed how I looked at these things. Um, you also mentioned self-care, which is like bubble baths. And for me, meditation, yoga, hiking, walking, getting endorphins up whatever you're physically capable of doing move that body even if it's just moving in place um and then you said also um contrary action and i find too don't you that when you take contrary action it feels hard at first but then you start to feel so good oh yeah i chose the path of integrity and wow does that feel better than having to lie hide feel shame and i would love to come to yeah. have it that it becomes a habit. Contrary action, if it, then no. we get heat, and it becomes a habit. Um, I have some I have some thoughts about younger men, by the way. Please, I yeah. What your sponsor was saying that it's just like, if nothing else, we're keeping them from finding a woman who might be appropriate for them. So it's not a kind thing to do to take up their time and effort and energy just because it amuses us. <laughs> yes. I think a lot of the much younger guys is uh, we're trying to do high school right. I think a lot of us were totally. not a popular girl in high school. And these younger men are just like the guys we had crushes on in high school. And this time we can get them because we're glamorous and we're smarter than they are. And we know our way around. We can wrap them around our little finger so we can make them into puppets of the, you know, the football star, or whatever it was we had. For me, it was swim team, captain of the swim team. Um, yeah. That. Uh, and uh, and again, that's not particularly being kind to this young man. Yes, he might get a kick out of nailing the older woman. It might he might get bragging rights off it. But is it really being kind to use him to fulfill our own personal fantasies? Exactly. And I fortunately I don't date so inappropriately young anymore. It's now like seven years, ten years, and my last eight year relationship, ten years younger. But it was a committed, healthy, mature relationship. Uh, but I do I remember that I was in my you know mid 30s dating people that were 21 22 and it was and i said the same thing these were the guys uh, i couldn't that was really a hitting bottom for me the story is actually in love attic which is like i was it started in the story about myself it starts out saying i was pushing 40 probably from the wrong side and walking <laughs> Banging a 19 year old in his halfway house in the bathroom you know just like yes like <laughs> it's because and i remember saying I'm, these are the guys that I couldn't get in high school. Mm -hmm. And now they're looking up to me and going, oh my God, you're this beautiful woman. And I'm like, this really cute young actor guy, you know, but there was, there was no compatibility. It wasn't love. And I think that, yeah, I thought, well, he doesn't care, but that's not the point. Is this an act of integrity? Generally, just overall, it, it doesn't have to be actively hurting somebody, but is it really 
Are you really doing yourself a service? Are you doing this person a service? And I think that's what's so important is we learn to live with integrity and honesty. Um, you know, of course, you and I are attractive older women, and so we're going to still attract younger men, and that's fine. But what are we doing there? Is it, wow, there's this real connection, age is just a number, or is this, this is my ego, and I want to know that this yeah, little body cases, likes me. You know. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, absolutely. And I think that's so oh, honest. So <laughs> yeah, because it makes you feel attractive. And, yeah, and it's the same thing as going back to that very same thing is which is you all in the world judge me by who I'm with, not by me. It because it's because yes. I feel invisible. I feel not enough. I feel I'm not going to be accepted in and of myself. But if I have this glamorous thing, and remember, a glamour is a spell. It is intoxicating, right? I am glamorous to this young man because I'm older and, you know, and, and a conquest. And he makes me glamorous because, mm -hmm. you know, he's young and adorable. And so it's, it's just all, it's all intoxication. It really is. It's just, it's, it's all addiction. Yeah. And I, I'm really curious to know your thoughts on uh, how we, I mean, I'm really, I'm still learning this too. And I'm, I'm love my life alone, you know, and I'm single and I enjoy my life and I have, I now find connection in friends. Like just being with friends gives me that feeling of connection and love. My cats, like you said, that lo love for children, love and learning that that can be enough. But I am kind of having currently in a state of examining and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Like if I don't date, like, let's just say I never dated again. Would I feel okay? And if not, why? Like, what is it that I'm, it doesn't have to mean you're missing something. You might just want someone to share. I really was just going, I just want someone to share, to have that intimacy with and have a partner in life and share these experiences. But I would just, even though I know we're, we're not perfect, I would love to hear what you think about that, about how can we find just peace in just being just us, just being I don't us. have any great answers for that. I have many yeah. of the same questions. I'm also currently single. I like being single. Yeah. One, 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 of, one of my other lines is one great cure for, for sex addiction is menopause. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the heat, really, the desperation really comes off that desperate need to, you know, like get skin to skin contact, still enjoy it. Don't have the desperate need for it. Now, some of that is just years and years of recovery. Some of that, I think, is just age. Right. Yeah. And so that's sort of that that constant, it's not a constant tone in the background, a constant hum of, you know, I don't have that, you know, sort of antenna on my head all the time going with him. Beep, 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 you, you, yeah. you, you, you. I don't have that going. A lot of that is recovery. I think some of it is just hormones. Our horm my, you know, our hormones just change. So I'm perfectly happy being comfortable alone. But I would, I do like the concept of having a solid long-term relationship. Many women I know have been in relationships of you know, 20, 30 years. And I go like, oh, that would be so nice. But I'll, I'll also hear them complain about their work. <laughs> Me too. So I, you know, I think that there's, there's positives and negatives. Um, statistically, single women are healthier, married men are healthier than single men and single women are healthier than married women. If you just go by blood pressure, by uh, lifespan, by just um, mental health stuff, it is healthier to be a single woman than a married woman. I think men are just very draining. They're, they're, yeah. bad, they're bad for our health in the long run. Uh, whereas women are very good for men because men you know, won't go to the doctor or stuff like that. They, they don't take good care of themselves. So they need a woman. I think men are more likely women often complain that post-divorce the man is much more likely to be in a relationship again than the woman oh, yeah and it feels like it's very unfair to the woman mm -hmm. but i think a lot of that is that men are just they need to be in a relationship more than a woman needs to be in a relationship i think we do much better on our own than men do men do not do that well on their own and they know it and so they just really want to get right back into another relationship and because we live in a culture where men get to do most of the picking um it's a lot easier for them to do that um, but I think also we, women, are, we're pickier, you know? Yeah. And so I am, you know, I, some, maybe I chose wrong, maybe not. As I say, I have been married in, in, you know, in recovery from sex and love addiction and it was a healthy marriage and we were just not compatible enough to want to spend the rest of our lives together. So after about four years, we parted amicably 
and you know, getting married didn't fix me and getting divorced didn't kill me. And um, and if it weren't for national politics, he and I would still be friends. <laughs> Say my last relationship. That's exactly that's exactly what happened with us too. Uh, that's so interesting. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, like I said, I love the journey of how much more self-loving we are from having done the work. And what have you, you also talked about uh, like the chemicals and what you've learned. And there was a lot, and I know that you've addressed this in your book as well. What have you learned about the science of addiction? Oh, well, there's a lot. Um, it's just, um, hold on. I've had some, I, uh, I, 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 I did a screenshot that I was talking to. Okay. Uh, yeah. That the, uh, um, was uh, Society on Addiction Medicine has a self test, and it talks about the hallmarks of addiction, right? Which is one is inability to stop using, two is the harmful consequences of use, three is unmanageability in other areas of life, four is escalation of use, use, and five is withdrawal. So I put it in like sex and love addiction terms. So inability to stop using. Yes, he's bad for me, but I run to him every time he calls. I can't help myself. Right. Mm -hmm. Harmful consequences of use. I got pregnant. I got herpes. I spent too much money on call girls. I'm getting a divorce. Right. Harmful consequences. Three, unmanageability in other areas of life. I got fired from my job for masturbating on a Zoom call. <laughs> Remember when that happened? <laughs> yes. Um, and oh, plenty of people are fired from their jobs for, you know, I, you know, you ever missed work because you're off chasing some guy or could oh, yeah. I have definitely overslept yes. and missed work stuff because I was with some guy that mm, night. Me too. Um, and I couldn't say no. And I couldn't say go home. And I couldn't say, no, you can't come over because I couldn't because, yeah. you know, because I couldn't, um, uh, escalation of use. And so I put, we text each other 10, 20, 30 times a day. I can't get enough. Right. And then withdrawal. If I don't talk to him, it feels like I'm going to jump out of my skin. Oh yeah. And so those are the hallmarks of substance addiction and it's the same thing. And as I say, we, we know that substance addiction is, you know, it, it is a chronic and relapsing brain disease characterized by obsessive and compulsive use of a mind altering substance, despite negative life consequences. And we know that it's that there's, you know, a mix of a lot of neurotransmitters, but the ones that I think are most relevant to our sex and love addictions are the ones you mentioned, which are the dopamine, which is the anticipation and excitement, um, the serotonin, which is the the sort of the exhale, they're just like the comp, they're just like, oh, I'm okay now, you know, yeah. I got my hit. I I heard his voice, right? Uh, I felt the touch of his hand. I smell his smell, you know, it's just like, oh. and then the oxytocin is like the intense bonding. It's that skin on skin contact. Um, and is, you know, it's oxytocin is what a, a mother gets when she nurses her baby. Mm -hmm. It's also what we get when we have an orgasm, you know, it's like good, good drug. Yeah. Good. Um, but some people, have more our receptors our brain receptors aren't sensitive enough it's just like the, we're putting out the dopamine and the and the serotonin and the oxytocin but they now know that the receptors in our brain aren't sensitive enough to them they we're pumping them out but we're not getting the response we're not we don't know that they're there um and the, so we keep stimulating it externally we keep trying to add more from the outside because we can't feel them uh, i say it's like yelling at a deaf person and you just make them deafer. And so we supplement from outside, more excitement, more orgasm, more, more whatever. And then, you know, and then there's the, the um, phenomenon of homeostasis. You know, we need to have balance. We need to produce them inside and get them from outside and be in balance. And the less we're producing inside, the more we're we're doing outside well the more we're doing outside the less we're doing inside so the homeostasis gets harder and harder and that's why recovery is a you know slow 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 process of returning to homeostasis ah uh, that's so well said and i really appreciate that because that was one thing i learned going through my own recovery that i don't know that anyone taught it to me it just kind of came as a epiphany i'm addicted to my own brain chemicals i mean oh, God, we're our own dealers we are our own yes 
And if you're a highly sensitive person, you're going to feel things more intensely, just neurologically. There's some people that we just have varying, uh, varying levels of sensitivity. And I feel things very, very, very deeply and intensely as an empath. And so for me, it's like that connection is that biggest high in the world. It's so beautiful. And and I can, like I said, I can get high just connecting with a not a, a someone who I feel is a like-minded soul or I, I resonate with them and their energy. And um, that's a really beautiful thing. I think one of the gifts of being a sex and love addict is that now I've learned to emotionally regulate self-regulate but i've maintained the ability to connect with people very easily mm -hmm. so one of my jobs now is uh, working for a music festival and what i do is sort of the pr and the marketing for it and it's but it's it's me going to businesses and saying hi yeah, and it's really public facing it's a good yeah. job for us yeah it's good for us because I, can, I just want to connect with, I talk to every stranger I meet anyway. And that's part of the, that's the thing that I'm proud to retain because I can connect with any person from any walk of life, have empathy for any kind of person, pretty much. I mean, you know, <laughs> and I think that, uh, what are some of the gifts that you think you've retained? <clears throat> um, well, I, uh, I have a, a life that works, you know, I mean, my, my sister is, proud of me. I recently celebrated 36 years of, um, you know, clean and sober time. And my sister would say like, I am so gosh, glad that you have all this time. Cause I, I just like, I think you would have been dead. I think that you would have died from, you know, drugs and alcohol. And I go like, nah, I would have died because some asshole I was living with killed me. Yes. <laughs> because, because he was drunk or cause I was going to leave him or cause he didn't want me to leave or, you know, so it's just like, my it, uh, my disease of sex and love addiction absolutely would have killed me. Yeah. It absolutely would have killed me. I I would have I would have gotten I would have contracted AIDS because mm -hmm. I couldn't say no to you know I couldn't say wear a condom right that yeah, was same I might leave right um, I would be with violent men because I thought that that was um, glamorous and sexy because they were so passionate about me he wouldn't oh he only hits me because he loves me so much right mm -hmm. because he's jealous because he's He's just possessive. That's all. Um, I just would I definitely would get myself into um, and then also, you know, and then you have to um, you have to take the edge off the pain of withdrawal. So you're going to be, you know, popping pills yeah. and driving impaired. So you're going to drive, you know, you're going to die in a car accident, which might also kill someone else, by the way, which we never think about. Um, and then there's suicide because you just can't stand the pain one more day. So, you know, I mean, this disease is absolutely fatal. It totally would have killed me. So I'm really grateful that I've got this life, right? And that I've got a life where I can relate to other people. I've no longer, I, I can have jobs with a male boss that I don't feel the need to seduce. That mm -hmm. made my career much more successful because before I got into recovery, I couldn't imagine a relationship with a man that didn't have some romantic or sexual component. I just, I would ro romanticize and sexualize everyone because I just thought that's what life was. And for, you know, 25 years or you know, about 25 years now, I've been able to have really nice relationships with men that, that aren't romantic or sexual. And it's enabled me to have mentors in my work life it's enabled me to have to be a good employee and to be a good employer um all of this is the things that i never would have been able to do if i was just living in my disease all all these years so i i shudder to think what life would have been like if i'd not gotten this gift of recovery because it was just it was purely unintentional i had a therapist i was you know, miserable from one more relationship ending. Well, I thought it was a relationship. The guy probably didn't think it was. <laughs> um, and I was whining to my therapist and my therapist, you know, sent me to one of these groups that I'm not going to admit having a, a association with because they're anonymous. And uh, and people were just telling my story and I went, oh my God, that's that's my problem. I'm a sex and love addict. Oh my God. Why didn't you tell me sooner? And he goes like, oh, I just found out about it. And it's just like, I'm sending all my patients. Everyone needs it. <laughs> it's so true. I, I think, God, if someone had known when I was 15 that that's what I was dealing with. Oh, my God. Absolutely. I absolutely should have. But, of course, people were telling me this stuff. Yeah. 
people were telling me this stuff for decades, but I couldn't hear it. Right. There's a diff that's confronting an addict is hard. And I've been on both ends of it. And it is the people that were the most honest with me. It felt terrible and embarrassing. I felt so much shame, but it was those people. And I remember who they are. Thank you to those who, who did confront me, who said to me, I can't listen to this anymore, Shannon. You have to get help. And funny enough, one of the people who got me into the program, she and I don't speak anymore. But I know she came into my life and it's because of my own actions of acting out of integrity. But she is the one that said, this is, she said, I empathize with you because I am, that's what she gave me a name for it. And she said, I, and she did it perfectly. Instead of saying, you need to do this. She said, I'm hearing a lot of myself in your story and I relate with this and I can't personally listen to this anymore. But what helped me was this program and I'd be happy to accompany you to a meeting. And if it weren't for her, I don't, hopefully I would have found it eventually, but it's, uh, I, even though we had to part ways, I, I am for eternally grateful. And, and the people that actually just confronted me and said, I don't want to be friends with you anymore because you're obsessed and it's all you talk about and you're self-centered. And as someone so sensitive, I'm like, I'm not self, no, I'm the most sensitive, loving person, but well, no, I was yeah, but consumed. Self-aware self is also self-obsessed. So yep. some, some of that constantly thinking about our feelings and how other <laughs> feelings are affecting us comes out of a lot of self-centeredness. <laughs> it does. And actually one of my therapists in uh, LA who was a renowned sex and love addiction counselor, he actually said, you're a narcissist. And I was so shocked because I'm like, me? I am like- Oh, that's a bad thing to be. I'm good things. Yeah. And funny enough, later I said, I told him that. He said, I, I don't think you're a narcissist. I said, but I was when I was- I said, I know why you said that, because I was exhibiting traits of narcissism because I was so consumed with anxiety and it's all I could think about. Like you said, jobs, I didn't ever get fired, but I was spending my days obsessing about my qualifier, which is the person who I used as a drug. Um, everything revolved around him and what was happening with him. And so I wasn't present and I and I couldn't, and I, I said, my therapist said, you have to cut off contact with him and I want you to send him an email, CC, BCC me on it and ask him for no contact. I said, nope. He said, what are you afraid of? I'm like, I'm not doing it. Left that session and went straight to qualifier's house mm -hmm. to do it again and make myself crazy again and want to take my life again. Well, yeah, because it's physical and you needed a hit. Yep. You needed a hit. It's just like a therapist that's a, a friend of mine says that she, listening to me talk about sex and love addiction, she said it, it really helped her with her patients to realize that when they're going back to that guy, it's not because they're stupid or willful yeah. or, not, or it's because they're in withdrawal and they need a hit. Yeah. My mom said, Shannon, why can't you just stop doing this? I, my mom is the best and she's my best friend and I can talk I to her about this. But, stop smoking. It's yeah. just, we don't smoke because we know that smoking is fine. We yeah. smoke because we can't stand not having not having nicotine in our system. The pain is so great. Uh, and I always just... tell people it's not depression. It's a nicotine thing. You're not sad. You're withdrawing. They feel the same, but it's not the same. Nothing yes. bad happens to you. You're just in withdrawal. Yeah, exactly. And we all go through withdrawal during a breakup, a separation. Some of us, I think, just... Don't handle process it. that differently. I mean, I you know, I I'd always say, how could she some, just be some okay? people can quit cigarettes cold turkey and some people yeah. can mm -hmm. Yep. And that's why we're here. And I will say that one of the biggest gifts of recovery is I've made some of the best friends of my life in recovery. Um, we've been on a healing journey together. I haven't known you personally on a like friend level, but I always admired you. And I appreciate you so much for your vulnerability, for the being of service in the way that you are by talking about this openly without shame and honestly and writing and taking the time to write a book to inform other people who may be struggling, who may know someone who's struggling for really di deep diving and doing the research because it's this, this thing is so common. And I think it's so common for humans to reach for something else to make us feel good. And I just want to thank you so much for sharing what you have 
And I uh, just wanted to ask you my last question, which is what, I mean, this is really a big question. Just what do you want people to know? What would, there's one thing you could tell people, just whatever comes to your mind. Oh, wow. Um, well, I think one of the great, uh, one, of, one of the great old slogans uh, around the rooms is if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. Yeah, right? Yes. And so it's just like, and and another one I like is we pretty much head, we pretty much end up in the direction we were heading. And so I try to be cognizant of where am I heading and what am I doing, right? So it is, it's about, it's about be here now because sex and love addiction is all about the, living in the past and living in the future. If only I still had him, if only I got him, right? It's just like, it's like bad pop music. <laughs> you ever notice that American pop songs are always about, oh, I wish I hadn't lost her or I wish I could have her. Whereas for some reason, reggae songs are always about, I'm so happy you're here. What, yeah. did, what, did, what did I get right in Jamaica? I don't know. Um, yeah. But I mean, I think that it is that um, that we were the, the sex and love addicts behave badly, but we're not bad people trying to get good. We're sick people trying to get well. And that this is, it is like the Society of Addiction Medicine says, it is a chronic and relapsing brain disease. My, I am not right in the head. Luckily, brains are incredibly plastic. Mm -hmm. Neuroplasticity is a gift. We get to grow and change our whole lives. And I don't have all the answers and I don't have it all right, but I know that I'm headed in a direction I want to be headed in and not in a direction that's causing a massive amount of collateral damage to the people around me. Um, I don't, you know, if, what is it? If you want self-esteem, do estimable things. It's, it, it's a lot easier to fall into self-loathing if you're loathsome. So I try to, you know, I, I try to, um, the late Carrie White, who is a wonderful person in, in recovery, and um, worked with me on, on quitting smoking. Everybody was afraid to quit smoking because they were afraid they were going to gain weight. And Carrie used to say, oh, it's easy not to gain weight. You just have to watch what you're eating. In other words, look at it before you shove it in your mouth. <laughs> right? Yes. I just need to look at, at, you know, I mean, do that in all areas of my life. You know, the whole sort of that feels good, do it, feels good, do it, feels good, do it. I have to start, I have to remember to slow down, take a little trip around my prefrontal cortex. Is that, you know, it's like you say, does that have integrity? Is that being of service? Is that the loving thing to do? Is that the, the or is it the selfish thing to do? Is it the expedient thing to do? Or, is, you know, it's just like, that. that I think is, a place I like to stay in my life. I'm not always there, but it's a place that I wish for everybody. Me too. That was beautiful, Ethley. Thank you so much for just agreeing to do this with me and for sharing your insights, your vulnerability, your beautiful spirit. You're just, I love you. You're just beautiful inside and out. So where can people find your book? Thank you. Well, the new edition of Love Addict, and if I'm very smart here, I may be able to show you the cover of it. Ah. There we go. Uh, new ebook edition is available on Kindle and, of I, and on iBooks. And you can still buy the old one on the internet, but I would say just get the ebook. It's updated. Uh, I write a blog called, uh, it's a Substack blog it's called Affection Deficit Disorder. So you can go to ethley.com. I have the website. So you can just go to ethley.com, spelled like that. And um, you can also go to ethleanvere.com. They're both me. And you'll be able to go to affection deficit disorder and you'll be able to, you know, order books and all this kind of stuff. So I just, um, I, I like that the book is out there because it hasn't, the information in it hasn't really changed. I hear from people all the time. The book's been out for like 10 years and I hear from people all the time going like, oh, I had no idea what my problem was until I read this book. Yeah. Thank you for writing that down. Just like, oh my God, that's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. So you know, if you think that you who are ever listening, if you think that maybe you relate, that maybe this is you, read the book. It's just got a whole lot of stuff in it. Yeah. Highly, highly recommend deep diving. I remember even just the first time seeing the big book 
in recovery. And sometimes those things can be boring where it's like a signed reading. And I was going, oh my God, I relate. Oh my God, this is me. It's so validating. So yeah, I'm not just funny and breezy and yeah, I'm ex- 1936. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And it's not dated. So yes, please get that book. If you relate, if you know someone who does, if you know someone who might benefit from it. And uh, again, what an honor to have you here, Ethley Ann Bayer. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you, Shannon, for inviting me. It's been lovely to get to know you a little better. You too.